because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Uh, today, I'm very excited about our guest, just to give you a little bit of background. Uh, you know, most, I work with a lot of elected officials and I like working with them, but you know, most of them are not on their own sort of great spokespeople about energy. So I try to help elected officials, but it's rare that you run into one who really gets it uh, from the beginning. But today we have one who does. His name is Governor Mike Dunleavy of Alaska. I first saw him at a Texas public policy event maybe six months ago, and I was just blown away by the, the moral confidence he had in the value of resource development in general and fossil fuel development in particular uh, in Alaska and his moral stand against the ESG movement. So I've been trying to meet him for a long time. Uh, I finally did meet him recently and I got him on the show. So very excited. Uh, Governor Mike Dunleavy, welcome to Power Hour. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. All right, let's jump right in. So as background, so you're the governor of Alaska. How important to Alaska is resource development in general and then fossil fuel development in particular? Uh, it, it's very important. I mean, that's why Alaska was purchased uh, in part from the Russians by William Seward in 1867 as a as a resource storehouse, also for its geopolitical location on the globe, both of which, by the way, are, are still in play and actually becoming more important as time goes on. So uh, Alaska has tremendous oil. I mean, we've produced over 18 billion barrels of oil out of uh, Prudhoe Bay and Kapar, the super giants on the North Slope. And we have billions of barrels of oil left to produce. And this is pretty much a conventional field as opposed to the fracting that you see uh, in the Bakken and down in the Permian. Um, lots of capacity in our pipeline. We used to produce upwards of 2 million barrels per day back in 89, 90. And that has slowly uh, dropped off to about 520,000 barrels today as we speak. We are discovering new pockets of oil um, on the North Slope. And um, we anticipate that our oil production will actually increase if, if, uh, uh, things are allowed to occur as they should, meaning that the market drives uh, the demand for oil. I find it interesting, if you don't mind me saying, I think it was just yesterday, that the Biden administration is imploring the uh, uh, OPEC cartel plus to produce more oil, which is, is somewhat ironic given the fact that they are doing everything they can to kill oil here in America, including Alaska. And so that's kind of the, uh, in some ways, the silliness of what uh, what some of these uh, policy decisions actually um, end up doing is um, causing distortions in the market uh, because of politics and ensuring that uh, homegrown oil production, gas production here in the United States um, doesn't grow at the expense of foreign actors. I mean, we used to work hard at trying to prevent the foreign actors from controlling our lives. And under the Trump administration, I think we're uh, producing about 13 uh, million barrels uh, a day, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, I think we're down to about 11.2 now because of some of the uh, actions of the administration, but also saw some, some market issues. But nonetheless, Alaska is a storehouse for minerals, storehouse for oil, storehouse for gas. Uh, we have one seventh of the country's timber here in the state of Alaska. Uh, we have tremendous opportunities. Our international airport, for example, and talking about geolocation just briefly, but our international airport uh, is now the fourth busiest in the world in terms of cargo, just because of our location on the globe. So we've got a lot going for us if we're just allowed to take advantage of these opportunities. And so uh, that's the issue. Uh, speaking of OPEC, you know, it, it reminds me of a story, which I actually learned from, I, I think a book we've both read, uh, Daniel Jurgen's The Prize, mm -hmm. about, you know, Prudhoe Bay and in the 60s, the the delays in early 70s, the delays in building that pipeline uh, by the modern environmental movement. And I wrote this article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was in 2010, about how the same amount of oil the Saudis took off the market was the amount of money that could have been transported by that pipeline mm -hmm. had it not been stopped. And so to me, that's a parallel of the current situation where we're stopping our production and transportation domestically. And then we're saying, oh, please, OPEC plus, produce even more than you want to. Yeah, it's um it, it it's it's almost an, it's it's almost the mild form of insanity to be honest with you because here we are America is the energy storehouse of the world. We produce we we are capable of producing more energy than just about any place on the planet. Yet because of politics, uh we refuse to do that and as a matter of fact this current administration is rolling things back. And it's just going to cost us more across the board. It's going to cost us more in jobs. It's going to cost us more in revenue. 
It's going to cost us more in wealth creation. And I think, and you and I talked about this, I think one of the things that people really don't get is that it really is going to hurt the poorest of the poor is what's going to happen because fossil fuels deliver the cheapest energy. Um, you know, no doubt renewables and the technology and renewables uh, are, are making that uh, the cost of that electricity cheaper as well. But nonetheless, what we have in place now in terms of oil and gas uh, and, and to, uh, to an extent coal, it's, uh, it's the cheapest form of energy right now as we speak. And so if you're a single mom with three kids and you're trying to make a go of it and you're driving your used car and you're trying to heat your home, um, you know, as we drive these costs up, as we notice that uh, price of gasoline, I think is, uh, uh, what is it, three to four, three fifty to four dollars. And so I'm places. in California, so it's much worse. Yes. So that doesn't help anybody, to be honest with you. And so cheap energy produces cheap electricity as well, as well as fuels for uh, for vehicles and, and planes. And it really does help the poor. So the poor, what's happening now is going to hurt the poor. Um. So let's talk about Alaska's uh, native population and how they are involved in resource development and how they, they benefit from it. Because this is something, you know, it's interesting that people who are against oil usually think, oh, I care so much about the native peoples of the United States. And yet they don't, they don't seem to be too aware of the role of how native people in Alaska benefit from industry. Yeah, to an extent, and I have to be careful here, but I think it's accurate. There's, there's, there's almost a form of soft soft racism, meaning here you have the native, uh, native folks of Alaska, especially the Inupiaq Eskimo folks who live on the North Slope, have lived there for eons. They live right on top of Prudhoe Bay. The little uh, village of Kaktovik uh, on Barter Island is within Anwar. Um, and if you talk to the majority of those people, they will tell you that uh, oil has transformed their lives for the better. It helps pay for schools. It helps pay, pay for hospitals. Um, it, it's helped reduce the cost of fuel and, and basically all around living on the North Slope. So without oil, you would have a pretty destitute uh, a, a place here in Alaska, here in America. And in some of our more remote communities in Alaska, and by the way, we have the uh, largest Native American population of any state, 15% uh, of our population is Native American. But oftentimes they live in some of the most remote parts of the state where energy um, is very expensive and the cost of living is very expensive. But I'll give you an example. My wife is in your back Eskimo from uh, uh, the Kobuk River village of Norvik. Our three daughters are tribal members and are members of their native corporation. All three work at Red Dog Mine, which is a large red, uh, large lead zinc mine north of the Arctic Circle. And they make a tremendous living uh, off of resource development, these three young ladies do. But this is what resource development can do, especially in your remote isolated areas, the North Slope, Northwest Arctic, and other parts of Alaska. But again, if they're denied that opportunity, what's the alternative for these individuals, for these, these groups of people to make a living, to, to, to be part of the American dream? Makes it real difficult because right now it is resource development in these uh, remote parts of the state of Alaska. And to deny those people the right to earn a living and take part in this American dream, I think is a form of soft racism. So you mentioned the Arctic Circle. Now today, you know, those of us who are not in Alaska, you know, most of the media, Arctic is viewed as just, oh, this place where nothing should happen. It's like the museum that we never visit, right? It's just yeah. like, okay, nothing should ever change there. It's the Arctic, it's pristine. If we do anything, all the polar bears will die. How does that attitude, because you, you see all these companies virtue signal about we're not going to drill in the Arctic, we're going to do it. How does that affect uh, Alaska, which is in it's that so, area? So, so the Russians don't, share that view that there should be nothing happening in the Arctic. As a matter of fact, the, the, the Russians, for example, they're developing their Arctic at a breakneck speed. And they're developing it in a manner, I think, that most Americans and others in the world would, uh, would view as um, not environmentally friendly. What people don't understand is Alaska, and we just mentioned our native, uh, native Inupiaq Eskimo population that sits on Prudhoe Bay, care very much about the environment. I, I'll repeat that, care very much about the environment. For example, in Yamal in, uh, in uh, the Arctic in Russia, where the uh, large gas operation plant is, uh, is, is currently producing gas, they have over 1,500 uh, wells that they flare. Alaska has no wells that we flare, none, zero. And so when you look at Alaska, <clears throat> we wanna keep it as, as, as pristine as possible, but it's really the people that live here that have the bigger stake, the largest interest in making sure that happens. And so I think we do a very good job of protecting our environment. But this idea that you can only do one or the other, if you produce oil, you destroy the environment. And if you, if you, uh, if you care about the environment, 
then uh, then it's just a national park. It doesn't have to be that way. Ne it really shouldn't be that way. And so in Alaska, I think we do a fantastic job with regard to environmental regulations, but I also think we could produce a lot more oil if allowed to do that safely. Isn't there other opposition to resource development besides just oil in the area? Yeah, for example, mining. I mean, this is uh, this is interesting. So, so the Biden administration is looking at a new economy, uh, a green economy built upon renewables. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm not opposed to renewables. As a matter of fact, uh, we embrace it because Alaska has tremendous renewable opportunities here in the state. But um, you need to get your minerals for a lot of your electronics and a lot of your batteries for this new economy based upon renewables for storage purposes. Well, Alaska is well positioned to provide a lot of those rare earths and a lot of those minerals. Yet the Biden administration doesn't appear to be interested in uh, mining in America, especially Alaska. So they're having negotiations and discussions with, once again, foreign countries to provide uh, these critical minerals. The problem with that is, again, you push the wealth overseas, you push the opportunities overseas, but you push your national security into the laps of some countries that may not be our friends. It doesn't make a lot of sense. America can produce a lot of this, uh, a lot of this uh, a mineral and, 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 and rare earths that we need. We just need to be allowed to take advantage of that opportunity. We'll safeguard the environment, but we'll create tremendous opportunities for Alaskans, for Americans, and also help our national security. And I think there are two very different attitudes toward environment at work, because one is the idea that we should just eliminate all environmental impact and that human impact on our environment is inherently bad. And so I think that's what's stopping everything, right? It's stopping oil development and stopping mining. And if it were taken to its logical conclusion, like you couldn't live in a place like Alaska, like you can't live in a place like Alaska without a significant amount of impacting your environment. I think it's about minimizing negative impacts, but still you need to impact it quite a bit positively uh, for it to be livable. And, and it just seems like what, what you and, and many most of the people in Alaska want is you want to improve your environment, including avoiding unnecessary pollution and destruction of beauty, but other people just don't want you to impact anything. Yeah, it's their, it's their, uh, to me, it's their distorted vision of, uh, of an Alaskan dream where they can, um, they can, you know, sit in their uh, lazy boy down south somewhere and feel good about efforts made to uh, make Alaska a park. The problem with that mentality is you eliminate opportunities in Alaska. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you've just taken care of the environmental problems for the world because you're just pushing those opportunities over to countries that will not have environmental re regulations anywhere near what we have here. So if you really care about the environment, and I repeat, if you really care about the environment, you do this type of work here in the United States and here in Alaska, where you can watch it, where we watch it, where we make sure that the environment is taken care of. You push it overseas, we have no control of what happens overseas. Now, I'll never forget, I was left with this image of a, a, a rainforest that was cut down, I believe it was in Borneo. And there was one tree left, and there was one orangutan in the tree. No trees, literally, for probably thousands of acres. If this is the vision of the environmental here, movement here in America, that um, we don't care what happens overseas, because we're, it, we're all interconnected, as we know. It's one world. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's, we're not hermetically sealed off from the rest of the world. If that's what they want, then they're going to rapidly increase environmental degradation across the globe. And not only will we, we, again, not only will we miss out on those opportunities, but in essence, their desire to save the environment in Alaska, which we're doing really well right now, we don't need their help, is going to hurt the environment overseas. So how do you feel about the current administration? We mentioned this a little bit, but the current, the administration's current policies and particularly the proposed policies, which are, are quite aggressive. I mean, how, how is that gonna affect Alaska if any of that goes through? Uh, it's going to hurt. It, it, it's going to, it's once again, it's going to hurt. It's going to curtail opportunity. Um, and it's going to make it very difficult for folks in Alaska to, to find high paying jobs to create wealth and create revenue for the state. What people don't understand is that Alaska is the only state in the country that in order for it to be accepted into the union in 1959 as a state, the 49th state, we had to agree to collectivize all of our mineral resources under the sovereign, under the state government. The reason that was required by the federal government back then is we had a small population, a big state. We used to be, we used to have four time zones. We're two and a half times the size of Texas. The feeling was that an income tax alone 
for 150,000 people, 200,000 people was not going to pay for the state of Alaska. So they compelled us to agree to develop our resources. That's the irony. In the 50s, in order for us to become a state, we had to agree to the Statehood Act and then put in our constitution that we will develop our resources for the benefit, maximum benefit of our people. The irony is now that they're trying to stop that. So we are the resource state. We're the only state that was compelled to do this. And the Biden administration is trying to shut that down. So you can see the problems that this is going to cause and the distortions it's going to cause, I think, within the, with the economy here in Alaska and the United States. Let's talk about the ESG movement. What, what are the impacts of that on Alaska? Uh, for the Arctic, it, it, it could be tremendous. And I don't think it's going to stop at the Arctic. I think it's going to work its way all through Alaska. So, for example, um, uh, we have a, uh, the largest rainfor- largest temperate rainforest in the world is located in Alaska, and it's part of the uh, Tongass National Forest. Well, a national forest is supposed to be managed as a national forest. It's where you have activities in there such as uh, uh, timber, mining, recreation, et cetera. Well, the past several decades, the federal government has decided to manage that forest as if it's a national park. So I mentioned earlier that Alaska has one seventh of the country's timber. We have a small, but because of uh, because of a whole host of reasons, including politics and policy, we have a smaller uh, timber industry than the state of Rhode Island, if you can if wow. you can imagine that. And so, I see the ESG movement just just growing, gaining steam, and potentially shutting down more economic activities surrounding resource development in Alaska. Because if it's the Arctic today. It's going to be a rainforest tomorrow, which it are, they're already impacting that now. Then it's going to be uh, some area that uh, out in western Alaska that they don't want to develop. And so Alaska is really at war right now. Unfortunately, war has been declared in Alaska with regard to our ability to, to survive as a state, a viable state, a state that can provi- provide opportunities for our kids and our grandkids. Our motto is one of the best motto, state models in the entire country, north to the, fu- north to the future. Well, we have a lot of our kids moving south. It's not good for a state. It's not good for the future of a state. And a lot of the uh, the uh, ESG uh, discussions that are going on are really, when it comes to the Arctic, are targeted solely at Alaska. We're the only Arctic state. But it won't stop there. It won't stop there. And, uh, and that's, I guess, the, the warning for the rest of the country and the other states. If you think that you're going to be insulated from this movement, you got to think again, because you just have to come up here, have a conversation with myself and others, and you'll see what's happening. Well, and I think that one thing that's going on is people just don't understand at all what's going on in Alaska. That's part of the reason why I wanted to bring you on, because I think if people knew what's going on, all the good things that are happening, all the good that might be stopped, all the good things that could happen that are not being allowed or that might not be allowed. Like, it's really great. I mean, I've been fortunate to visit there before. And, you know, it's, it's an amazing place, but I, I really want to get out of people's head the idea that I don't think most people know Alaska and the Arctic are related. Honestly, I think it's just the Arctic is really just in most people's mind, like a place with polar bears. It's just like one giant. It's just like a big polar bear zoo. And all we have to do is just make sure nothing happens to it. It's a place where people have lived for thousands and thousands of years. And that's that that, again, is kind of some of the the strange, uh, the strange uh, mindset of those that are in the extreme environmental movement. People are part of the environment. We are part of the world. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our Inupiaq Eskimo people, for example, have lived in the Arctic for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And um, nobody knows how to take care of the Arctic uh, better than those folks do, better than our people do. So I, I think people think of Alaska as a um, as less of a state, unfortunately, as less of a state and more of a uh, some type of mythical place that must be saved from itself. The fact of the matter is we, we do a pretty good job of saving Alaska. We, it's, it's our state. It's our home. It's our backyard. So we look out for it pretty darn well when you look at the environmental regulations that we have. But this idea that you have to stop all resource development and all progress in the state of Alaska is, 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 is a bad fairy tale. It, it doesn't result in anything that's going to be positive. Because in the end, if you, again, if you offshore all these opportunities, you're just going to ruin the environment uh, across the ocean. And um, it's still part of the world environment. And if you don't care about that, I guess it's not an issue for you. But I can tell you this, in Alaska, we do it better than any other place, I think, on the planet. We take care of our state better than any place, I think, on the planet. And um, we really don't need a lot of help in doing that, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, you're getting anti-help. 
Can uh, you imagine? I mean, right just now. just just for a minute, you see all the you, you can go on a, a YouTube or websites and you'll see a, you know stop this mine or stop oil production. Can you imagine if you saw commercials like that that says save Delaware, or or, or save West or excuse me save Rhode Island? You don't see that because it's almost as if the folks down south. Uh, They've either given up or they don't care about those states. But for some reason, Alaska is some place that has to be saved from people. Makes no sense. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I wonder. There's there's somewhat of a worship of the cold right now, which is very peculiar in a lot of ways. Just the idea that like the Earth is too hot, which is weird because it's a really cold period in history, and you know we have way more cold related deaths than heat related deaths. But people who don't live in the cold at all. And who generally want to go to warm places think of it as, oh, well, Alaska, like that's the real, that's the ideal earth. So we have to preserve that. Yeah, Delaware, that doesn't matter. That's just like human place. But yeah, the, the Arctic is like this natural earth museum. That's like the way the earth should be. And so they don't even think of there being people there. We're a state. We're the 49th state. We're one of the 50 states on an equal footing with the uh, the right to develop our own destiny within the framework of federalism, with a, with a right to develop opportunities for our kids and our grandkids, like any other state. Um, and like I said, we take care of it better than any other state. We take care of Alaska better than anybody else could. And so again, don't worry about us. We'll be okay. Just allow us to take advantage of opportunities and we'll make sure that we take care of the state. Come up and visit, but... Um, uh, Alaska, again, has got tremendous opportunity if the politics will allow it to happen. Final question. How can the rest of us and the rest of America help? Because I think a lot of people seeing this will be motivated to help Alaska uh, fight back against these bad governmental policies and these bad ESG finance policies. Yeah, you, you know, you, you really got to educate yourself. You got to do a deep dive past the uh, past the. Um, uh, 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 environmentalist left leaning uh, uh, media. Uh, that wants to, uh, again, uh, uh, view Alaska as nothing more than this mythical place that must be saved. You'll see that we don't flare our gas. You'll see that when you park a truck on the North Slope, there's an absorbent, uh, uh, we call it a diaper, put it underneath it, just in case there's a drip of oil coming from a, uh, from a, uh, a transmission or an oil pan, which doesn't happen. Uh, you'll see that we really do take care of our environment here in the state of Alaska, better than just about anywhere. And so educate yourself on why Alaska was purchased uh, the United States, what we're able to produce and how we're able to help the United States, including its national security by producing it here in Alaska, the 49th state. So just educate yourself. Don't necessarily buy into the, uh, the, the armchair environmentalist or the knee jerk reaction that Alaska is somehow is uh, being degraded. It's really not. We could produce gas, we could produce oil. We've done it uh, for 50 years in Alaska, going on 60 years in Alaska. And um, uh, we contribute to lowering the cost of energy if we're allowed to do that. So I would just ask the people that are viewing this program and others, just educate yourself on the state of Alaska as opposed to the mythical, magical place that uh, some people just want Alaska to be. It can be both and it is both, but again, we need to be given opportunities here to develop our, our resources in the manner that we believe are, are conducive and in alignment with what the people of Alaska want. But you got to educate yourself on what the state's all about. Thank you. And one, one final comment is I'm very much looking forward to having some people, more people from Alaska. And I'm particularly interested in getting any Inupiaq Eskimos who would be willing to talk about it, because I think that they will also have a powerful story that that people don't just hear, but that like the story you're telling will really resonate with people. Yeah, you'll get some uh, you'll, you'll get some participants from the North Slope. That'll be part of your program. I have no doubt about it. All right. Thank you so much, Governor Dunleavy. Take care. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Before I wrap up today, I have a special surprise or at least a uh, treat. So I had one very good energy political official on today, and I'm actually going to have another one. He, uh, this was recorded last week. I got to interview Congressman Dan Crenshaw, whose podcast I've been on. He's never been on Power Hour, so this is sort of a, a short version of that. I hope to get him for a longer amount of time uh, later, but we were both speaking at the Young America's Foundation conference, and I reached out to his team and asked if he had a few minutes to just do a quick interview on the state of energy, and he uh, was happy to. So we had an interesting 10-minute discussion, and I thought I would share that with you as a bonus. So enjoy, and I'll be back on the other side.
I'm here with uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, and I've got a bunch of uh, questions for him about energy. So uh, first thing, you had this post recently in response to Bernie Sanders, and you were calling him out for saying, you know, CO2 emissions are an existential threat, and yet being anti-nuclear. Has he responded to that? And I'm curious, like, what your take is on why he has this seemingly impossible position. Yeah, I, I tweeted Bernie a lot. He's never responded, you know, so, <laughs> so I, don't, I don't expect him to uh, this time either. But it, it does get to a, um, a problem the left has on this one. So the more moderate Democrats will be, will be pro-nuclear, even pro-carbon capture. And uh, I had a hilarious hearing the other day on the Environmental Subcommittee. Or maybe it was, you know, you know it, was the, um, it, was the, it was the Climate Change Select Committee. And uh, the chairwoman, because I made the statement, like, uh, you know, Democrats are against carbon capture. They're against nuclear. Uh, but but they're talking about solutions to climate change. Like, these things are, are in contradiction. And she says, no, we're not. You know, we, we support these things. And then she's not totally wrong. There are, there are Democrats that do. But then the next Democrat uh, representative gets on, John Kasten, and he just he calls, he, he goes on to call carbon capture a boondoggle and all these things. So I'm like, see, this is why we say the things we say, because you guys are not in agreement on this. Um, and And even though you sort of support it, you know, you also won't deregulate nuclear to the extent that it would need it to be in a, in a safe and, and common sense way so that it can be even close to competitive enough to, to operate in the free market. Um, and, and again, if, if we're going to invest in something, if, if, we, if we believe that we need to spend money to, re, to reduce emissions and to combat climate change, OK, if, if, if we agree on that, then the question is, like, what are we going to spend money on? Are we going to spend money on on China made solar panels and, and, and cover large swaths of American territory just to have energy that isn't reliable? Or are we just going to build a nuclear plant? You know, I, I mean, I, it just doesn't make sense. Their trade offs are very strange. And it's because they're look, it's because they're just beholden to the solar and wind industry. I'm not against solar and wind. I just don't think they should get the, all of the special treatment that they do. It's ridiculous. Like, I think solar has 250 times more subsidies uh, per unit of energy than nuclear does. This is this is stupid. <laughs> this is stupid policy making. Uh, so I, th th they're going to continue to have a problem with that. And regular Americans see right through it, I think. So the solar and wind thing is interesting because what you're noticing is so there's this view that, oh, we care about CO2. So we're anti-fossil fuel, but then you're anti-nuclear and then also anti-hydro. Right there against large yeah, scale against hydro. hydro too, but right. even with even with solar and wind, you're noticing Robert Bryce has been pointing out there's this massive kind of green local movement against yeah. it where they're the stopping the mining. Especially. So and what you're noticing, those leaders don't seem to care too much. So it's interesting that like they're against all forms of energy in practice. And so to me, this points to like the ideology of just believing that human impact is bad, industry is bad, development is bad, because they never seem to find a form of energy they actually like. I'm curious what your take is on that. I think that's true. Like the more radical uh, environmentalist you get, the, the, the more you, the, the more what you start to encounter is this hatred of humanity, this, this belief that humans are just bad. And like, that's really actually what they think. I mean, stop reproducing, just die off. Like we're, we're a scourge on the earth. I mean, this is, this is fundamentally what they believe. Now, again, like most people on the left don't actually think that, but, but, but the reality is, as you've pointed out, is a lot of their policy is driven by that radicalism. Uh, and it, it infiltrates into their mainstream policy making. And so that's why you see this highly contradictory conversation happening where like they, they just ap appear to not have a plan in place. And it, it's very discombobulated. Um, so one point you made about nuclear that I like is you mentioned that, like the extent of deregulation that would be necessary. So I, I refer to this as decriminalization because I think it is virtually criminalized now. What appetite is there among Republicans for radical reform? Because I agree totally if there's not radical reform, it's not going to be able to compete. It's just too hamstrung. What, yeah, what do you think the appetite is for that level of it? P pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, Republicans are are surprisingly smart on this issue for once. <laughs> like when it comes to the environmental question and, and just what we should be for and how we should talk about it. You know, we're, we're, we don't really debate the whole climate change thing. And there's definitely some debatable things that the left claims. But we kind of just move past that and say, well, the, here's the solutions. And, we, and look at these. These solutions don't even cost us that much. And they have a better effect than your solutions. And so I, I think people in the middle now are left wondering, like, what is it? I, th I thought Democrats were the environmentalists. And it turns out Republicans have a much better strategy here. Uh, we just need to tell pe more people about it, of course. Um, but, and, you know, I think market it better, which is, which is what I try to do. So I, I, I do think there's a lot of appetite on nuclear. 
So you and I discussed on your podcast back in February, like the Texas debacle. And so my own view is this has not been addressed very sufficiently. What's what's your view on how Texas has responded so far? I, I didn't follow the, a lot of the details of the legislation that was passed. Um, like there were some very simple failures that just need to be addressed. Like, for instance, production facilities or so or. You know, so the, the places where natural gas generation was happening, they weren't getting power. Mm-hmm. So it became this sort of cascade effect. And like just putting them on the list <laughs> to get right. power in crisis, you know, you just got to fix that little problem. Um, I don't think there's been substantial changes, right? We, we, you know, we don't have a capacity fee in Texas. We still don't. I'm not sure that that was the right choice. I, you know, I'm just, but that was an option, right? Mm-hmm. Because, because fundamentally we haven't encouraged baseload energy enough in Texas. The same problem California has. California has a much worse problem than we do. And they, they seem intent on making it worse. But, you know, when everybody was like, oh, Texas, oh, you're making fun of California. Well, yeah, we were making fun of California, but also we have the same problems as California. So let's, you know, we admit that though. Uh, we, we, we built a lot of wind um, and which is fine, like build more wind, but uh, you, you, you can't get around the fact that you need to have baseload energy that works when you need it. And so don't disincentivize investments in that. And, um, and, and our market doesn't incentivize it very well. So uh, you, you're right. I'm not sure that's been addressed. I mean, there's other options that I thought were pretty interesting, like Texas could just pay kind of a single fee. And Berkshire Hathaway would offer to build 12 natural gas plants. Like that, that was one thing they, they presented. I don't know where that's at. But so there's options out there. But, but some, a bit on, to be honest, a lot of it was just tweaks um, that I think needed to be made, weatherizing things that should have been weatherized. You know, and like the other reality is it's a once in a lifetime you know, winter freeze that is extremely unlikely to happen again. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be more prepared for it. And doesn't mean there's not some lessons learned. So. I think I think we'll come out of it okay, but we do need to build some more baseload energy. That's the fundamental problem. Yeah, and on that note, so if you look at like this summer, I mean, even early in the summer, Texas is having shortages. I'm in California, so you know we have shortages all the time. One thing that seems like Republicans should say is like this is just unacceptable. Like in America, we should have low cost, reliable electricity in any situation. What appetite is there for just like saying, look, this is people have just accepted this new normal of, oh, yeah, Gavin Newsom is going to pay me to not use energy in the afternoon or Texas, it's 90 degrees and we have problems. What can we do to like reframe this? Yeah, I mean, we should talk about energy justice. The left is always talking about environmental justice. Mm-hmm. We should we should say, look, the, our baseline needs to be that people can power their homes in an affordable way. All right. And then, yeah, we can make that cleaner. But as is. But, but you can't undermine the entire system for the sake of trying to make it cleaner, which, again, is what's really happening in California and to some extent Texas. So um, you know, it's probably more on people's minds in California because energy prices just rise faster um, in, in, in Texas, less so. We, we haven't had the same kind of rolling blackouts that, that they've had. But, you know, again, except for these sort of um, anomalous events. But, yeah, it, it, it's about education. It's about education on what baseload energy is, where, where, your, where your stuff comes from. A lot of people just don't know. Um, a lot of people don't care. They, they're going to the grocery store. They're picking up their kids from soccer practice. They're, they're living lives. And so trying to get that to them is, will continue to be a challenge. Final question. So one thing that struck me that I've really been impressed about you is you've been in this position of, yes, we do impact climate, but that doesn't mean it's a catastrophe and that doesn't mean we should outlaw fossil fuels and certainly we should embrace nuclear. What shaped your thinking on this issue? Because like to me, it's a good sign that you're thinking this way and other Republicans are thinking this way, but I'm curious where you got it from. Just the facts, um, <laughs> like just the, you know, because it's, it's just fascinating to go through the UN's data. So, okay, let's like, fine, let's just accept the scientific consensus. But it turns out the scientific consensus is not what the left says it is. Right. The scientific consensus is like this sort of lukewarming scenario where, yeah, I mean, th- there's a cost, but it's not this enormous cost. I mean, in my talk, I was like, look, the UN consensus is by 2100, we're going to have 2.6% less GDP than we otherwise would globally. That's but that's basically nothing. <laughs> so so you wanna you wanna destroy the economy and, and and impose enormous costs to 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 deal with that that small cost? Like what are you doing? Right, the, the, the GDP of that is so much higher. If you just put it in GDP terms, it'd be so much higher to quote prevent it. 
Right, it's so much higher. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's a cost benefit conversation, and yeah. um, the left just moves right past that because because they're arguing from this this position of superior moral sense. You know, or at least they believe so. So, you know, they it's very emotional. They don't they don't need to assess the the, the costs and benefits the way we think they should, like any problem solver would. But it's just how it's how they do things. Um, but also, it's also why I think we're slowly winning that argument. But only, but only recently have we really engaged in it. I mean, you know, yeah. only before it was all about. It really was about denying climate change. That just, just wasn't going anywhere for right, us. It was for, like just a pure scientific thing. Like I think the more it's an issue of what is the impact on human life, mm -hmm. the more it's a winning issue. Plus, like, hey, if you care about this issue, nuclear is this alternative. I think yeah. on those, yeah, the kind of energy humanists are going to win the more that we get heard. Yeah, exactly. And there's that off ramp, right, from the sticky sort of is climate change real or not uh -huh. kind of debate, which just gets you nowhere. It just doesn't get you anywhere. And most people. It, it, we've kind of lost the debate anyway, so just it's better just to move past it and 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 and, and use some of the stats that, that we put out. Like, yeah, it's happening, but it's just it's also not the catastrophe they say it is. They're lying to you. The scientists agree that they're lying to you, and so here, here's the truth, and then here's how you mitigate it, uh, and in a reasonable way. And most people want that reasonable solution. I mean. Right. I think they uh, like uh, surveys indicate that people want to spend about twenty six dollars a year on, on climate change. <laughs> so. All right. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that, that's that's a far cry from the 90 trillion from the Green New Deal. And they're already spending thousands of dollars and they don't even yeah. realize it. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. How much money they could be saving. And that, that's always the thing. It's like uh, if if you start getting your if, if you start paying double what you pay now for electricity, but you get it from solar. You know, you, you, you clear a bunch of land just west of Houston and you find you, great. You feel good because you got some solar. Ask yourself a question like, what do you what do we what benefit does the world get from that? I mean, really, like what benefit? Uh, it is not clear that you're getting any benefit. That's why I point out too. Uh, again, according to the scientific consensus from the U.N., if we all stopped emitting by all, I mean, all developed countries just stopped emitting right now, uh, we would. We would have a 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit uh, temperature reduction by 2100. So it's like what, so, what, sounds what worth you, suicide. Well, yeah, it's like what are you getting from this? Right. You know, and it's it, look, it, there's, it's going to get a little warmer. Sure, sea levels will rise. They've been rising for a long time. We should expect that, but there's not going to be tsunamis all of a sudden. You know, just you, you got to adapt to some of these things. Um, and uh, just a more reasonable conversation, I think, wins the day. Yeah, I think it's great. All right, man. Well, thank, thanks so much so, for talking. That's all you do. Thanks for being a good champion. Appreciate you. Thank you to Governor Mike Dunleavy and Representative Dan Crenshaw. It was enjoyable to talk to both of you. And, you know, the fact that we have, I think we're having really improving elected officials on energy issues. Um, I won't take credit for these two in particular, but I think I'm having a positive influence in general on elected officials. And so I, I think, I hope and expect we'll see more people going forward who are really what I would call energy humanists, who are really thinking about the big picture of what will advance human flourishing, who look carefully at both the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels and other forms of energy, and therefore end up supporting more energy in the world, uh, not less. So that's an exciting prospect. Obviously, there's a lot of headwinds there. I mean, that's a complete understatement. Lots of bad stuff going on, uh, but some signs for optimism and some, you know, it just show, it goes to show that if you promote the right ideas, some people will listen and then some people become articulate spokespeople themselves and the truth will get out there. So speaking of the truth getting out there, just a couple of notes. I've been posting a lot lately on Twitter about the UN climate report and the media distortion of it. The climate report itself, I talk about as a mess and then the media distortion makes it even worse. So on Twitter, I've had a couple of um, prominent posts. One of them that I'll, I'll share in my newsletter. So make sure you're on my newsletter uh, or you, you can probably see it at industrialprogress.com. Uh, by the time you see this, or a day later, uh, I, I fact-checked Twitter. They made this egregious statement about the amount of warming expected in the next 20 years, and I corrected them, and they seemed to totally ignore it. But then, lo and behold, I checked today, and they actually did cor correct their egregious error. Now, they didn't really publicly apologize for it, but they did at least publicly correct it 
And I've called for an investigation of this. So encourage Twitter to really take seriously because they, they put out something that just misled millions of people. And it was a very obvious kind of thing. And it just shows that whoever is running that operation in terms of science news, uh, there's something very, very wrong with what's going on. So yeah, definitely encourage Twitter to investigate. And they should, given that I pointed out the error, they should have me help investigate the situation. Uh, also check out, as always, energytalkingpoints.com. We're going to be posting a bunch of new stuff there soon. And make sure you're on my newsletter, which you can sign up for by going to industrialprogress.com. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. If you like the work that I and the rest of the Center for Industrial Progress are doing, you can support it financially at industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. That's our accelerator program. And I'm recording this on Wednesday, August 11th. We're having an, an upcoming accelerator call exclusively for accelerators. It doesn't matter how much you give. You can give $1. You're still invited. So that'll be this Sunday. And then we're going to, we usually have them bi-monthly, but for the next several months, I'm going to be doing one monthly. So if you want to ask me any questions, hear about the latest strategies, hear the latest developments on my book, Fossil Future, uh, that is the place to be. Also, Fossil Future. So we have a definite date, uh, February 22nd, 2022. So 222, uh, 22. And just uh, finishing up various iterations of the manuscript, but it's going well. And uh, unless there's some catastrophe, then it'll be out on February 22nd. Uh, 2022. So very excited about that. Let's see, just making sure I am not forgetting anything else. Uh, I think we are good for this week. One final note is uh, encourage people to check out this podcast. You can share my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash improve the planet or share my podcast, review it on Apple podcasts or any other podcast platform. I rarely give these kinds of reminders, but uh, I can tell from other people that they're very helpful. So figured I would try this, uh, I, I try doing it at least once in a while. All right, that is it for this week. Thanks again to uh, Governor Mike Dunleavy and Representative Dan Crenshaw for joining me. I'll be back in another two weeks. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.